Hi, I'm Jorge Rosas Labrada. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Alberta. Um, I'm joining you today from Toronto, the traditional land of the Huron Wenda, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Great River. And my name is Erin Hashimoto. I'm a master's student in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Victoria, where I'm calling from today on the Kwangan territory and also lands that the Hussainich, Esquimalt, and Songhees people have continued relationships with today. As the title slide here uh, suggests, we're gonna be talking about legacy text collections and particularly their importance for communities and for student training. Uh, before we do that, I wanna give a little bit of context for this talk uh, so that we can all be on the same page. The first part is that there is great value in legacy materials, and we're defining these as written and audiovisual materials from the past. There are two concrete examples of this. One would be, for example, the Breath of Life Institutes, which started out in California and have taken place now in a number of other places. Um, at, during these institutes, indigenous community members work in archives to retrieve, understand, and mobilize legacy materials that then they can take back uh, to their communities uh, to create teaching or learning materials. Another concrete example is, for example, the revitalization of Niamia, an Algonquian language spoken in the US um, by Daryl Baldwin and his colleagues. However, their countless primary language materials are still inaccessible, uh, both to the indigenous communities where the research took place and to the scholarly community at large. And this is mainly because either they were never archived or they were deposited in difficult to access archives. And in some cases, like the case that we're going to be talking about today, they were deposited in an accessible archive, but in an inaccessible format. The second piece of context here um, has to do with language documentation. Um, we have here a representation of a possible language documentation workflow from project planning to archiving the materials. As you can see, this is a multi-step process that involves uh, several steps, for example, metadata, time alignment, transcription, and translation. And that relies on specialized software, such as Seymour, Elan, Flex, and others. Therefore, working with such a collection um, or with the Lexicacy Text Collection can provide an opportunity for um, the person working with it to use a variety of linguistic software and to understand the process of archiving linguistic materials in terms of formats, metadata, depositing, et cetera. The final piece of context is importance of these materials to communities. They provide a link to the past. They also are uh, constitute important cultural information regarding song, ceremony, and history. And they constitute lang valuable language samples that can be mobilized into teaching and learning materials. This is true for all communities, but especially so for those that are engaged in reclamation because they don't have any uh, fluent first language speakers. As Jessie Little Dolbert recently put it during her LSA plenary, legacy text collections and materials are a way of us learning from our ancestors. The goals for this talk are to highlight some of the contributions of legacy text collections to student training and to communities. And we're going to be doing so through a case study with the legacy text collection for Maca. And this is joint work between myself and Erin. And the workflow that we're going to walk you through applies to this text collection um, because it included audio and reading materials, but it may not apply to all collections and may need to be uh, tweaked depending on what you want to do. To give a brief background of the Macau language, it's most closely related to Machano and Ditidat as Southern Lokashian languages, with Macau itself being spoken in Nia Bay, which is in the very Northwest of what is currently recognized as Washington State. The language has been classified by some as dormant with the last fluent first language speaker passing in 2002, but the language has continued to be taught in schools with the support of the Macaw language program. There's a fair bit of documentation of Macaw, but we'll be focusing on the Jacobson collection at the California Language Archive, which has both audio and written materials publicly available online. 
This project had two main goals, the first associated with research and the other with student training. For research, this had to do with glottalized resonance found in all other Wakashan languages. For example, N, M, L, Y, and W in Kwakwala. And we have an example given by Margaret Wilson that we'll hear in just a moment. Um, Jacobson had proposed that the loss of glottalized resonance in Macaw resulted in the lengthening of preceding vowels, but there was no quantitative data available to support this claim. Kya 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 to chase away. Um, for student training, this project gave me a chance um, to get experience working with documentation and revitalization as well as repatriation, which all aligned with my own interests in linguistics as an undergrad student. To give you an idea of what we were starting with, these are the materials um, created by Ralph Latchester, translated by Mabel Robertson, and recorded and transcribed by William H. Jacobson, available through the California Language Archive. As you can see, the CLA was able to digitize all of these materials, but the existing formats weren't easily readable and searchable. The metadata also didn't always clarify the exact relationships between the materials within the collection. Looking first at student training, the project began with our application to the University of Alberta's Roger S. Smith Award for Undergraduate Research. Jorge and I worked together to set a scope for my project, goals for what the project would do, and he helped me through my first research application process. With the approval of Maria Pasqua from the Macaw Language Program, we worked on this project during the summer and fall of 2018. The project worked to create a small time aligned corpus that would allow for audio transcriptions and translations to be viewed all at once using three open source software, Audacity, Seymour and Elon. In the next few slides, I'll be talking about the steps to create the corpus, returning the materials to the CLA, and repatriating the materials to the Macaw language program so that they and others can use the corpus for research. The first step of the project was to edit the original audio files using Audacity. Because these stories were originally recorded on cassette, some were recorded across two files if they were very long, and in other instances, multiple stories were told on one cassette. So I edited these so that each narrative would be aligned with one file. Once that was done, the edited audio was imported to Seymour, which let me bundle all of the files associated with each story together for the corpus. I was able to add the metadata, naming the people involved with the recordings and when the materials were made, et cetera, and segment the audio. We divided the audio up according to intonation units, so based on prosodic cues, and that allowed me to take cues from the speaker themselves rather than relying on punctuation in the written notes or my intuitions as an English speaker. And once everything was segmented, I imported the files to Elan so that in addition to the transcriptions and translations given in the written notes, I could add more natural translations rather than the word, word by word translations that were given and any additional notes um, that had come up for each segment. When everything was completed, the project files were returned to the California Language Archive to be held along with the original copies so that anyone who came across Jacobson's work could also find time-aligned, typed, and searchable versions of these particular stories. It was also an important part of the project that the work be given directly back to the Macaw Cultural and Research Center. Um, although most of this work was done using open source linguistic software, there were also other preferred formats such as Word, Excel, and PDF that were requested by the Macaw language program. I formatted these with time periods for each segment so that they could still be used more easily in alignment with the now independent audio files. And we sent those files in both digital and physical formats on a USB so that they could be shared within the community as well. In the end, the final corpus was four narratives that made up 60 minutes of audio, 94 pages of annotations, and 857 intonation units. Uh, another part of what I made for the Macaw Language Program was a guide for use that explained how to access and work with the materials in Seymour or Elan, 
and as well how things were organized in the other formats, such as the Word, Excel, and PDF copies. Lastly, I want to talk a bit about what I learned from this experience as an undergrad. This project gave me the chance to work with a bunch of software that I might have otherwise only heard about in classes, and it allowed me to understand how these programs can work together as part of a larger project. I also got experience working with an archive, making sure that I knew what kinds of formats they accepted, what metadata they needed, and how to actually deposit materials. And lastly, I got a better appreciation for how valuable text and corpus-based approaches to presenting um, documentation can be. For me, just typing up the notes, I was able to notice a lot of different patterns and look at how some of the same words showed up across the texts. Um, more generally as well, going through this process from application to a public and general undergrad presentation was a good reminder of most people's awareness about language revitalization and reclamation efforts. Uh, presenting my research more broadly outside of the linguistic community was a reminder of the need for continued advocacy and also more interdisciplinary conversations about language reclamation. I'm gonna, now that would give me an introduction to the project and talk about some of the contributions to student training, uh, we're gonna talk about some of the contributions to community. This is based on the feedback that we received from Maria Parker Pasqua, uh, who works for the language program in Nia Bay in January, 2019, after sending back the materials. Um, one thing that became clear was that there were some small changes that were needed. This is because the materials used the Jacobson uh, writing system and, they had, and the community had adopted a new writing system. So uh, there were some changes that needed to happen. It also became clear that in fact, the, um, even though the materials were in the CLA, the community didn't have access to them, um, but they do now. And so Maria said that Jacobson had allowed them to have cassette copies some years ago, but they were not translations or transcripts, um, just the titles of the recordings. Um, and she said that she had tried transcribing a few, but that it wasn't easy. Um, another contribution is that the stories can then be further enriched with additional material. So Maria said that she had additional comments on the transcription and translation, and that it would be good to add them as additional ELAN uh, comments. Finally, there was a general appreciation for the work, especially given the time constraints and many duties of both Maria and other folks involved in language work in Nia Bay. Um, and this became clear from the first time that we contacted them for approval to work with the materials um, to the end of our collaboration. More generally, these materials can um, provide reading for both speakers and language learners. Many indigenous communities face a lack of reading materials and is an issue for many language revitalization and reclamation programs. And then tech, therefore text collections have two main advantages. One is that they represent naturalistic speech, but they also have cultural value and therefore they actually make for great reading materials. They can also be used in the language classroom and there is a number of different case studies showing how using corpora in language pedagogy can be beneficial. Beyond this, um, the work increased the accessibility of the materials. In January of 2021, we were contacted by a community member who had listened to how the Macaca Nia Bay, one of the stories in the corpus on the California Languages Archive and wanted to know if there were more time aligned materials. And so he was wondering, in fact, how, um, whether there were more transcriptions um, and whether, and appreciated the importance of the time aligned format. And he said he really enjoyed being able to listen to the language and see it translated. To conclude, working with legacy text collections is a long multi-step process. However, it's worthwhile engaging in this work. Um, the materials are rich sources of valuable information, both for researchers and communities. And they're also an excellent way to train students and build capacity in communities. Um, and especially for student training, it's also an excellent way of 
uh, training students without putting the burden of that training on the communities themselves. More importantly, we have a responsibility to return these materials to the originating communities to help in their efforts to maintain, revitalize, and reclaim their languages. We would like to finish by saying thank you to the Maca elders who worked with Billy Jacobson and to Maria Parker Pasqua for her reassuring enthusiasm and support of our project. Um, to archivists everywhere, uh, but especially to Sacco Hagen at the California Languages Archive for his help with the Jacobson Maca materials and to our funding so sources, both the Roger Smith Undergraduate Research Award for Erin and the Banting Postdoctoral Fellowship. Thank you.